My Favorite Raccoon by Brendan Bozeman I first saw Gary as I awoke with my hand nearly dragging my mug of whiskey off my lap. I was dozing on the back deck, my legs up on a table. Knowing Gary, he may have made a noise on purpose to see how soundly I was sleeping. Of course, he wasn't Gary then. He was just a raccoon. His eyes glittered up at me, his little hand poised on the top step. I could barely see the rest of him by the dim light coming through the kitchen door. He stared, measuring my threat level, then took a step forward. As he came into the light, I could see that for a raccoon, he was big. Very big. I grunted, hoping to scare him off, but he only stopped and stared again. I didn't want those claws to go to work on my legs or arms, or face. I cautiously worked up a loogie, breathed in slowly, and hocked it at him. He scuttled back a few steps. The spit was on the top step, and the animal, staring me dead in the eyes, crept forward and licked it up. Shocked and feeling a little violated, I stood up and suddenly yelled. My movement set off the floodlight, brilliantizing the deck and beflashing his eyes. I'm not very tall, but I'm taller than a raccoon, and he scurried off the steps. He soon slowed down, however, unimpressed with my display, and ambled to a chair. From there, he could reach the top of the fence and pull himself up. He took one glance back at me, squinting into the light, and then proceeded along the top of the fence, which creaked to one side under his weight. Jumping onto the neighbor's tool shed, he disappeared. There was a crash, then silence. I sat back down, dumped in a little more whiskey, and waited for the light to go back off. Eventually, I passed out on the chair and was not awake again until 2 a.m., when I wondered whether this visit had happened at all. I got the mug from the deck and the whiskey and went inside. But, about a week later, I lay on my living room couch watching TV, again with a mug of whiskey. Yes, it was my habit to squunch away the day's frustrations at the brokerage firm with a few drinks. It was nothing that could really hurt me. A lot of the analysts even socked a few back at lunch and every night after work. I did it mostly alone, but no one blamed me if I had shadows under my eyes or had bad breath. Like many Fridays, I had gotten buffalo wings, eaten them on the porch along with some Oreo packets, and moved into the living room. I had no reason to hold back on the whiskey. I had left the porch door open for cross-ventilation through the apartment, and I dozed off. I awoke to the sound of something in the kitchen. In my sleepish state, it sounded like someone knocking a wall down. Guided only by the flickering TV, I jumped up and rushed to the kitchen, where I turned on the lights. The same raccoon, I knew it was the same because it was as fat as a basketball, had the cabinet under the sink open and was rummaging through the trash. I pushed a shout through my dry, puffy throat that came through as a coagulated clump. It looked at me as if I had rudely interrupted it, turned begrudgingly, and walked out the back door. He didn't look back to see if I was following, and he didn't hurry, not even a little. Once he was out, I stomped as loudly as I could as I ran to slam the door. I took a last swig, undressed to my boxers, and lay down in my bedroom, wondering how I could get the enough cross vent if I couldn't leave the back door open. Because the city sprayed for mosquitoes, there was no screen on the back porch. I didn't have the loud window ACs, so I needed the circulation. Perhaps... I would get a screen door, which I did the next morning, battling the grumpiness and brain fog of hangover to charge my drill, go to Home Depot, assemble the materials, 
and put it in. It was miserable. I sweated cold sheets and then shivered in turns. My arms ached, and I was impatient with the tools and the pilot holes. The door did not close well, but it closed securely. I hoped the raccoon would respect the screen as a barrier, though he could easily rip it. Needless to say, it didn't work. A few days later, I was again awoken by a sound from the kitchen, and when I stomped over, the same beast was going through the trash, and the screen was in tatters. I yelled at it again, and he acknowledged me, but he made a strange hiss. I didn't know raccoons hissed, as if to say, yeah, whatever, give me a minute. Knowing what I know now, it may have sounded like bitch. He reached in to find one more chicken bone, stuck it sideways in his mouth, and went away. That seemed dangerously bold. I would have to keep the back door closed, cross vent or not, at least for a while. I also got metal clamps for the trash barrels outside. I didn't bother to fix the screen. And yet the raccoon got in several days later. Once more, I was awakened from a pleasant whiskey rumination on my couch, and again I scared the animal away. As I cleaned up, I wondered if I had remembered to shut the door. I thought I had made sure, positively sure, it was shut. On the other hand, I usually left it ajar for a while and only closed it when I went to the living room. Perhaps I had forgotten. I had been fighting the haze all day at work and had returned home with the pleasant pain in my forearms that only a nice glass of gold can relieve. And maybe I hadn't closed it after all. The next time this happened, however, was different. I was absolutely sure I had closed it. I had used a trick from my boarding school house parent. I had put duct tape on the door. It will rip off the door jam if you open it, but there is no way of pressing it back on after you return to your room. That way, it was obvious if someone had sneaked out. This didn't exactly apply here because the raccoon obviously wouldn't close the door behind him, but the fact that the tape would be on the door would be proof enough that I had indeed remembered to close the door. That night, I had a bat ready, and when I heard the telltale sounds, I ran in, screamed, and hit the floor. The raccoon didn't run. He stood up on his hind legs and threw his palms up as if to say, what the hell? He eyed me, and to this day I think he shook his head disdainfully before walking, calmly walking, away. The tape was on the door, so I had closed it firmly. I looked at the doorknob from the outside, expecting to see dirty handprints, but I saw none. His paws must have been clean, because either the raccoon had reached up and turned the knob, or a burglar had come in and run away when he realized someone was home, after which the raccoon had come in. Both possibilities were far-fetched. Either way, I would have to close and lock the door from, that, from then on. I would have done that before, but I was afraid I would go outside without unlocking the knob again and end up locking myself out. Imagine my wonder when the next day, as I came home and placed a new bottle on the kitchen island, I saw a bowl on the floor filled with clean chicken bones. Stranger still, there was a pile of thoroughly licked Oreo wrappers near the recycling bin. I sat down on a stool next to the island, took some whiskey, and tried to think it through. There was no doubt the door had been locked. I always locked it in the morning. That part definitely wasn't an issue. I got up to check the door. It was firmly closed, but unlocked. There were no handprints on the outside. Perhaps this time I had been robbed. I looked around the apartment and found nothing missing. The placement of the bones and wrappers was baffling. 
It was as if whoever it was made an effort to be tidy but didn't know that cookie wrappers don't go in the recycling bin. I cleaned up, washed my hands thoroughly, and got the rest of the chicken from the fridge. I stared at the door as I ate. I considered the same questions over and over. It made some sense if it was a person, but why hadn't they stolen anything? In Chicago, no one picked locks. They usually just smashed their way in. And that door had a window. On the other hand, they could have used a bump key. They don't require too much skill. If it was a raccoon, how could it have gotten in? It couldn't use a bump key, could it? Raccoons break in, don't courteously leave food waste in a bowl and separate the recycling. But people don't either. And how had it gotten the bowl from the cupboard? Maybe it was in the dishwasher? I made no progress toward a solution. But it got stranger. Two days later, the same thing happened. But this time... Some of the bones were arranged on the ground in the form of a word in all capitals. M-O-R. More. The word was more. I sat for a long time sipping my whiskey. I took a picture of it with my cell phone. I went to the living room to watch TV. I started to get drunk. I went back to the kitchen to look again and think. I cleaned up and ate dinner. The next morning, for some reason, I decided to put a hunk of meat on the floor, and then, exactly how the idea came to me, I don't know, I put a pencil and a piece of paper on the floor, too. That afternoon, the meat was gone. But this time, instead of bones in a bowl, the trash bag itself was next to the kitchen door neatly tied and ready to be set out for pickup. I ripped open the bag and found that the bones had been chewed and licked clean. Oreo wrappers were again next to the recycle bin. And to my total begogglement, there was a note with letters crudely scrawled on it. M-O-R-M-E-T. More meat. The pencil lay next to it, the eraser and part of the shaft chewed heavily, perhaps either as a way to say, yes, it was me, the raccoon, or because, like many a writer, he had chewed it absently as he shrugged, struggled for the right words. My thoughts raced through a thousand different scenarios. The most plausible explanation was that I had gotten up drunk and written the note myself. But I didn't believe that. I wasn't much of a prankster, least of all to myself, and I had never been a sleepwalker. It's hard to describe what it's like for something truly inexplicable to happen in your house. You return to the same thoughts again and again, just like when you look for a wallet in the same places over and over again. What I was witnessing was impossible, and yet it was the only thing that was possible. It was just Occam's razor. As I got drunker, I started thinking of taking him on tours. There must be money in that. We would be minor celebrities, like that guy who traveled around with a chicken that had no head way back in the 30s or something. I would give him the best food in the land, and he would perform for the crowd and I would make sure he didn't get in the hands of medical researchers. Oh no, they do terrible things to animals. I thought I would need a name for him, and after rejecting Rascal, and Ronnie, and Burglar, and Scamp, and Mark Twain, and Einstein, I settled on Gary. It may be because I was drunk, but it sounded right. SpongeBob's pet's name was Gary, and they were both unusual, so why not? The word I used for him, pet, reminded me of my uncle. 
He had been a police officer, and it always brought me back down to earth from childhood flights of fancy. He had warned me about that word, strangely enough. I had long before read Rascal by Sterling North. It was required reading, but I was fascinated by the idea of a pet raccoon, and I read it twice. I'd say it counted as my favorite book. I told my uncle many times how I wished I could have a raccoon. I was shy to tell my parents because I knew they would reject the idea outright, and I thought he would be a little more sympathetic. And he was, in his own way. He said the book was a fine tale, and a true one, but that I should avoid raccoons. It sounds like fun, he said, but they're wild animals, and they don't make good pets. That night, I prepared a dish with some vegetables to the side and put it on the floor. I also composed a note, all in capitals. Wrappers, no recycle. Bottles, cans, yes. I found an old water bottle and left it next to the note as a test. The next afternoon, everything was in the trash and the bottle was in the recycling bin. The plate was in the sink with some water in it. I was ecstatic. There was a note on the counter that read, in a mixture of capital and lowercase letters, How about steak? How, I thought, did you start learning lowercase letters? I paced and drank. I went to the supermarket and got some steak. I cooked it, took half for myself, and the next morning left the rest on a plate along with a note. Is it cooked okay, Gary, if I may call you that? Then I wrote out the full alphabet in capitals and lowercase. The next day was the response, using capitals and lowercase correctly. Perhaps a little more well done. No broccoli. Little was spelled L-I-T-E-L, and broccoli was spelled B-R-O-K-L-I. I cooked his steak as ordered, prepared asparagus with butter and garlic, and set out fresh bread on a smaller dish. I wrote, it's spelled little and broccoli. This is asparagus. His response read, okay, broccoli. Thanks for asparagus, but prefer carrots and no garlic. And there was something else. The night before, I had done a load of wash, but I had left it in the dryer with the dryer door open. Now, now the clothes were heaped in three piles on the floor. Shirts, t-shirts, and socks. No problem, Gary, I wrote. I'll take care of it. Thanks for separating the laundry. As an experiment, I folded one shirt and one t-shirt and rolled up one set of socks. The next day, the laundry was all neatly folded. It's worth noting that my astonishment had not worn off, even as it was becoming a routine to find some amazing leap of progress in Gary's abilities. But tonight really capped anything he had done before. I had forgotten to buy whiskey on the way home. There was only a little left, which I polished off, and since Gary had left a request for some baked beans and a little pasta, I went back to the supermarket to get some more along with his food. When I got back, I had just started cooking when I realized I had forgotten to get the whiskey. I ransacked the apartment and, to my relief, found a half pint in the couch cushions. It was enough to tide me through cooking dinner. However, I met with near disaster. I ate in front of the TV, and instead of going right out to get more whiskey, I thought I would let what I had drunk wear off a little. Suddenly, I woke up. My phone said it was past 1.30 a.m. That would make it a real scramble to get to the liquor store in time. I'd have to go into the city for that, which was a pretty good distance. Then, I heard scratching at the back door which must have been what had woken me up. 
I went to the door and opened it slowly. Gary was sitting on the back porch, looking up at me, and there was a bottle of whiskey in front of him. I picked it up. Red label. I was speechless. Aside from everything else, this was better whiskey than I was used to. He looked at me and made a strange sound, as if he were trying to say something. Why don't you come in, I said, opening the door wide and stepping aside. He came in and happily started eating the food I had left out. I sat down and sipped the red label. Where did you get this, I asked, not thinking at all about whether he could talk or not. He looked up and said in the combination grunt, growl, and whine, Wa week or so. Wa week or so, I repeated. Weeka. Wicka. Liquor. The liquor store. You said the liquor store. Jalika sto, he said. Good job, Gary. He turned away sheepishly. I cleared his plate. He hopped onto one of the stools, leaned onto the surface of the island, and picked up the pencil. Laboriously, he scrawled out a single word. Spit. Spit? What do you mean, spit? He tapped the counter with his paw and said, Sit. Spit on the counter? Gary nodded yes. I didn't argue, but I got a plate first. I spat on it and put it on the counter. Gary lapped it up eagerly. Do you like the taste of the whiskey? I can pour you some. Gary shook his head and said, No. Then he tapped the paper again. I replenished the plate, and he lapped it up. Well, Gary, I won't comment on your choices. Gary started for the door. I said, look, Gary, why don't you stay here? I'll put a blanket on the chair in the living room for you. He reared up on his back legs, gave a little hop with his arms up, and then went to the living room. I set up the blanket, and he lay on it. We watched TV. He seemed attentive, and I took the liberty of explaining what was going on. It was a financial program. I have no idea whether he understood anything, but after a while, he apparently got bored, curled up, and went to sleep. The next morning, I woke up with that feeling of not knowing where you are. Again, I wondered if I had been dreaming the whole thing, but the red label was on the coffee table. There was noise in the kitchen. I went there and what? On the island was a breakfast of fried eggs, bacon, and toast. Coffee was brewing and a pan was soaking in the sink. I froze, stock still. Gary sat on a, school, on a stool patiently then motioned with his little hand toward the plate and said, in labored but clear words, for you. Jesus, Gary, you didn't have to do that. How did you do that? He blinked knowingly and with a touch of pride. I poured myself some coffee, went back to the living room for some red label, sloshed a little in, and sat down to my, bre my breakfast. I helped him learn to pronounce some words. I got some food for him from the fridge, but he put his hand up and said, Eight already. Want go out. Sure. I opened the door, and he went off. I didn't see him again that day, and as I sat in regret that by 6 p.m., having frittered away the whole day sipping whiskey without having gone out for more, I heard scratching at the door, and there was Gary with a fresh bottle. How did you get this, I said. Never mind. Good whiskey, isn't it? I made food for him, and we sat on, in the living room watching TV. The next day, breakfast was served, and I limited myself to just a little sipping. 
Gary came in and out a few times, and the next day, after another fantastic breakfast, I went happily to work. Gary and I settled into a nice routine, and I felt lucky. Before Gary, I had basically just eaten, worked, slept, and drank. Now, I actually had an interesting life. Unique, anyway. I got the food and cooked him dinner. I also spit on the plate for whatever reason Gary had. He made breakfast, did the laundry, and tidied up the house. He also kept me supplied with whiskey, which more than paid for his board. Where he got it, he wouldn't say. I also taught him more about business and investing. He was interested in the news, especially Fox Business Channel, and I explained things to him as they came up. With the DVR, I could stop and replay as necessary. He would run back and forth to the TV screen. I, in turn, learned a lot from him. Often, he would tell me about raccoon life as we sat on the back porch. I had no idea the politics that went on amongst the local raccoons. Whose territory was whose, which included who had first dibs on certain trash cans, who the bigwigs were in the raccoon world, or the wheeling and dealing involved with finding nests, especially if it involved expecting mothers. I found it to be a lot like the world of business, actually. He told me he had to go out some nights to beat up this one raccoon who was always trying to take his nest. That was just sound planning to maintain possession of his holdings. I once put the Nature Channel on to see his reaction, but he scoffed at it. He had no interest in deer or moose, and he was contemptuous of penguins. He wouldn't say why. He was confused by the foxes. Those foxes aren't as smart as they look, he said, turning his palms up. All the best food is right here in city trash cans. Or, in my case, with my buddy Mark. He bowed his head and extended his hand in a flourish. But those foxes gave him an idea. I'd like to eat a mouse, he said. I paused. Why don't you catch one? There are a lot of mice around. No, these city mice are gross. I'm talking about healthy ones from the pet store. Can't you pick up a couple? I don't know, Gary. I'd feel bad. It's no different from feeding mice to a snake or catching one in a trap. Yeah, but come on. Reluctantly, I agreed, and I brought him a white mouse the next day. Just one thing, Gary, I said. I can't watch. I'll leave you in the kitchen with it, and please get it in the trash can and wash your hands when you're done. I heard a little squeaking, then the sink. He came back in and said, Delicious. I avoided his eyes and took a swig. It was only a few days of bringing him mice before I noticed a change in Gary. He was growing white fur, and his whiskers were different. He made chewing motions even when he wasn't eating, and he gnawed at things absent-mindedly. You look different, Gary. He was put out by that, but he conceded he felt different, too. Maybe I should stay away from the mice for a while. I should mention that over the past weeks he had been getting bigger than ever. I mean, huge. His hair, his chair could barely hold him and it creaked when he jumped up on it. He was also physically bigger, as in his frame was bigger. When he stood up on his hind legs, he came halfway up to my chest. That got me thinking about touring with him again. What do you think about going on the news, Gary, I said. They'd pay a lot to have something like you on. Some thing? You think of me as a thing? Oh, no, Gary, I, I, they would. You bring me into a TV station, and I'll go out in a cage. Forget it. That won't happen. I'll make sure. Really, I wasn't sure about that at all. You and me would make a great team. They'll want to do experiments. I'll make them sign something. But what if they do want to do an IQ test or something? 
What harm can come of that? Gary pulled back from me just a little and did not speak. Fine, forget it. Gary sat up in the chair like he was a human. I think there's more money to be made in the stock market. Look at you. You don't earn, you don't earn a living balancing beach balls on your nose. You have a point, Gary. But how can we do that? I thought it over that night. Getting a raccoon into financial services. That would be tough. And mind you, those were the days before there was much remote work. But I tried to see it from Gary's perspective. I told clients every day it was their job to dream, mine to make it happen. Why couldn't I do the same for Gary? One afternoon, Gary left the Wall Street Journal on the coffee table. He had circled an article about Russian oil. I got the journal delivered, but rarely read it. I just piled it on the back door and recycled it once a week. Gary had been reading it avidly, however. The article said Putin was taking over the oil industry, using, in part, a front business whose address turned out to be a liquor store in Minsk. The article was buried about ten pages in. Gary was on the chair, sleeping. He opened one eye and said, What can we do with that? Hmm, I replied. That ought to be big news. Hold on a second. I called a friend from work and asked him if he had seen the article. He hadn't. He said it sounded like a hoax. Gary, I think you've got something here. This could be as close to an inside scoop as I can expect. If it's really true that Putin is taking over the oil industry, there would probably be some fear about supply, Gary said, which will make oil go up. Yes. I scrounged everything I could and put it in an oil fund, and the next day I had a good report. Gary, just today you earned me 500 bucks, and the news isn't even out yet. I told you there was money to be made. I only wish I'd had more to invest. How can I thank you? Gary's ears perked up. I have a favor to ask. Shoot. This is a word I instantly regretted. I want to eat a cat. Oh, no, I said. No way. That's just going way too far. There are kittens at the pet store. They're almost the same size as a mouse. What's the difference? Nope. N-O. There is no way I am getting kittens for you to eat. Why on earth would you want to eat a kitten anyway? I just want to see something. See something? What? Gary licked his paws. Nothing. Just forget it. Gary was silent for a time, and I was only too happy to let the subject drop. He wasn't finished, though. How about you give me some of your hair? Hair? Gary, come on. It's just hair. I've been eating your spit for weeks. I know, and it's gross. And I'd like to know why you do that, too. What does it hurt to give me a little hair? It's weird, Gary. Just eat normal food. You made a promise. Rolling my eyes, I cut off a lock of hair, which he gobbled down in spite of some difficulty swallowing. He also convinced me to give him some nail clippings. I wrote it off as him still having some wild in him, but it's also when I learned not to promise someone whatever they want. You have to set the terms in advance. I drank my whiskey. Over the next day, he kept pushing for more hair and nail clippings until my fingers and toes were down to the nub and I was starting to look like a marine. But he kept giving me good stock advice, so I couldn't complain. He spent all day reading the journal, watching the business shows, and going on the computer. Yes, going on the computer. He even had his own user account. He would give me his ideas, we'd discuss them, and I'd pitch them to my clients. More often than not, he had the right calls. That was the good thing about our new arrangement. 
The bad thing was that his demands for odd things to eat did not abate. One day he said, How about a little skin? Skin? Just scrape a little off for me. I'm not cutting skin off for you. How about a little blood? That won't do you any harm. Just prick your finger and put it on a little plate. Carry. I didn't think I had a vampire raccoon for a pet. He bristled at the word pet. I'm helping you. You have to help me, he said. No. But he kept working at me, and after a few days, I gave in. I put a scraping of skin on a plate, using a fish-gutting knife that had been sitting in the drawer for years. Little did I know how useful it could be. He snatched the flake of skin like a leprechaun and wrote a piece of gold. Before long, I was giving him blood, and I started having second thoughts. It all felt extremely weird. Just as my uncle had predicted, Gary was not turning out to be the nice little cute pet I had envisioned in a raccoon. And in spite of his amazing qualities and the money he was making me, I began to resent him. One night, after I had woken up on the couch, I looked at myself in the mirror before going to bed. My face was puffy and had lines on it from the cushions. I'm not a good lie if I'm going to be good looking guy if I'm going to be honest. I have a fairly elongated and sharp nose, and my teeth look a little rodent-like. Rat boy is what I was called in school. My elfin ears didn't help the appearance, and my round, brown eyes gave me a look of innocence that many mistook for naivete. I had a spare tire that I had never been successful in getting rid of. I couldn't get back to sleep, and minutes passed like snails. I wanted to make the most of this situation, but I didn't like being used as an hors d'oeuvre. The next day, I told him no. No more skin, no more nail clippings, no more blood. Which brings me to this. A few days later, I woke up on the couch with my hands bound with a pair of handcuffs that my uncle had given me. A chain went through my arms, over the back of the couch, and around a radiator pipe. My feet were bound in duct tape. A handle of red label was on the coffee table. There was also a glass of water. I had a headache and the sun was in my eyes. Gary sat on the floor near my feet, looking at me. Gary, what the... He said nothing. Freaking undo me! He had only one word for me. Skin. What the hell are you talking about? I got you plenty of booze, the good kind. It's Saturday morning. It's a long weekend. I do not get what you are saying. Have a drink. I did, awkwardly, leaning over the table and lifting one of the heavy bottles to my mouth. A little spilled on my chin. Gary approached the coffee table and pointed to the fish gutter, which he had helpfully placed within reach. I could not get a word, a word out of him. He just sat and stared. I said nothing, so after a long standoff, Gary went to his chair and, ordered, and turned on the TV. We watched Cashin' In, Forbes on Fox, and Red Eye with Greg Guckfeld on DVR. I kept drinking in the wretched belief that it would help me think of a way out. By noon, I was pretty looped. I was getting hungry, and Gary was not going to relent. All right, I said. I leaned to get the fish cutter and knocked it onto the ground. Gary picked it up and extended it to me. I considered grabbing it and making a stab at him cutting his fat belly open and watching the look on his face as he absorbed the violence and vengeance of a betrayed friend. But I didn't. Even if I got him, how would I get out of the chains? Who would hear me yell? I had bought that house specifically because it was quiet, 
as separate from the others as you could get. I had also wanted to save money on housing. I was determined to retire by 50. So I was in a crappy neighborhood where no one bothered with other people's business and where they turned away from trouble like a faint scream. Go on, said Gary. Get a good chunk for me. A chunk? Yes. Not just a scrape this time. It has to be a chunk. All you asked for was skin. That means a scrape. I could hear myself whining. That offer has expired. Please, Gary. He stared. Will you take these chains off if I do? You'll be fine, he said. It wasn't lost on me that that was hardly a promise, but he had the upper hand. What was to stop him from starving me down and taking whatever skin he wanted? I sat up as much as possible. I dug the knife into my ankle just above the duct tape, and I carved out a hunk of skin. Blood flowed, and I pressed a pillow against it. Gary picked it up and popped it into his mouth with satisfaction. The fact that I could read his face worried me. I had never been, it had never been very expressive before. I had to expunge his emotions based on his words and body language. Now it was fairly understandable, like a CGI version of facial expressions. He went to the bathroom for a minute and carried out gauze, tape, and large sanitary patches, which he threw on my lap. I covered the wound. Gary, what do you want? I think at that time I knew what he wanted. I'm not sure. It's hard to remember because of what happened in the next days. But it was finally dawning on me that he was becoming more and more human. He smiled, just raising the corners of his mouth in a freakish display of bloody teeth. I want to be you. He didn't need to tell me to take another drink. All I could do was sob quietly. I tried yelling a few times, but I knew it wouldn't work, and he threatened me with the fish gutter. The process continued. Every few hours, he would be back for another chunk of my flesh. He slept a lot. I drank. He gave me the remote so I could at least flip around. He made sandwiches for me and brought water. He provided me with a jar to piss in. Other than that, he showed no compassion or kindness. The next morning, his face horrified me. His snout was markedly shorter, and his whiskers were gone. Hair was falling out, and he was walking on his hind legs comfortably. There was no end in sight to this torture. There was plenty of food in the apartment, enough for weeks and he snuck out occasionally to get roast chickens and more whiskey. How he did this, I still don't know, but it got me thinking. Gary, when you wanted those cats, why didn't you just break into the pet store the way you do everywhere else? He didn't take his eyes off the TV. It's too far. I'm not driving yet, you know. And it's not as if I can fly. I'm not magic. His breath... My breath was suddenly taken away when I realized that, had I acceded to his request for cats, he may well have transformed into a cute, fluffy, lazy, and docile feline. Not this monster. I said, you're getting pretty damn big, you know. He replied mockingly, and hungry. By the way, he said, nudging, nudging the fish gutter toward me, I'm feeling a little puckish right now. I moaned. Gary, when is this going to end? You'll know. Just undo the chains. I promise I won't run. And I'll give you all the skin you want. Skin, he said. His harsh tone of voice disturbed me. Gary, I have to take a crap. Can you undo the chains just for a bit? Mark, he said, raising his eyebrows skeptically. I may what know you too well. You don't go more than once every four days. I must rip you in half when you finally go. He laughed at this. 
a true human laugh, and it sounded repulsively close to my own. Now, let's go, bud. The chunk. He said the word chunk carefully to be very specific. By then, I had cut through my pant leg and created acres of little grooves that had scabbed over. They hurt every time I moved. I carved out another, and he gobbled it happily. Somehow it disgusted me that he, hadn't cl that he didn't clean the chunks in a bowl of water the way a raccoon normally would. That night, he couldn't fit into the chair, so he used my bed. He took the gutter with him to make sure I didn't cut through the duct tape. Not that it would have mattered much if I did. The next day, he was walking on his hind legs all day, and his face was passably human. He was grumpy, and he insisted on more and more chunks of flesh. Go deeper, he said. Get some fat. It was becoming an agony to comply. He wisely kept a few feet away from me, detecting my increasing desperation. By then, I was determined to slash his throat the moment I had the chance, even if it meant dying of thirst on that couch. I kept drinking as heavily as I could. By the next morning, his transformation was leveling off. You better take some serious twigs, he said. Gary, I was weak. He hadn't fed me the night before, and there was nothing on the table for me. This is going to hurt from now on. From now on? Drink. I complied. I drank until I passed out. When I awoke, my hands were duct taped firmly around the leg of the table. Gary had a pair of bolt covers. Thank you, Gary, thank you. At least I would be free of the handcuffs, which had made angry red circles around my wrists. Instead, he snipped off all four fingers of my left hand. I tried to headbutt him, but he slashed me savagely with the fish gutter. I wriggled my fingers around, but he always got them in the end. The pain was blinding, and I puked burning bile onto my shoulder. He picked up one of the fingers and moved it towards his mouth. Just not in front of me, Gary, please. He gathered the other fingers and took them to the kitchen. I could hear him gobbling the flesh and cracking the bones. He had left a bottle on the floor with a straw in it, and I drank deeply, listening to the blood dripping onto the floor. I couldn't pass out, and I had to watch and listen as Gary marched around the house, made food, and, to my horror and rage, tried on my clothes. He spent most of his time in the kitchen. At least I didn't have to look at him or listen to his sardonic ultimatums. That night, he left the house for a long time, and I finally passed out. The last thing I remember was Greg Gutfeld talking about hot tubbing with Lou Dobbs. The next morning, was it five days by then? Gary stood above me with a hatchet. There was a rope tied tightly around my right leg above the knee. I'm sorry, bud, he said, but this will be the worst of it, I think. Please, please, please. He brought the hatchet down on my knee. I screamed. He had to hit a few more times to get the leg off. Then he pulled the, right, the rope very tight to stop the bleeding. I writhed on the couch, but I was so weak and hung over, and I knew so well that getting out of the chains was useless, and the squiggling around made the pain so much worse that I forced myself to be still. I remember little from that day other than listening to Gary's lips smack in the kitchen. I kept the TV as loud as it would go. If you've ever wondered about the state of mind of someone in that kind of situation, whether it's like the movies, I can tell you that yes, it is, more or less. I had no idea of time. I could only stare at the ceiling and roll my head slowly from one side to another dreaming impossible dreams, unsure what was awake and what was asleep. 
I felt like I saw Gary cutting the tape around my hands. He cleaned the fingers and my leg and rebandaged them a few times. He did the same with my face. He always had the gutter at the ready. Somehow he got antibiotics that he put on the table, saying I could take them or not, but if I didn't, I'd die. Sometimes it was bright, sometimes dark. Much of the time the TV was on. My only relief was more whiskey. I know that Gary cut away my pants because eventually I crapped myself and I was naked from the waist down. There was a towel and a basin of water so I could get clean. Once, I didn't bother with a jar and Gary responded by striking me several times with a stick and withholding food. There was one thing I remembered distinctly. Gary stood above me wearing my best suit. His face was a grotesque approximation of mine, as if I had been severely beaten with two grutch-looking circles under, my eye, under his eyes. They're worried about you at work, he said. I've been telecommuting for a while, but they want to see you. He dabbed a little red label under his chin like cologne. His fingers were bony and long with cracked, blackened nails, but they were passable. Wish me luck, he said. I prayed someone would notice something wrong, reveal his perfidy, call the police. Maybe I would hear someone at the door looking in the windows, breaking in to make the horrible discovery. I screamed and hollered all day. My phone was next to the TV. If only I had gotten the iPhone 6, I would have just had to say, Hey Siri, and help would be on the way. But of course Gary would have thought of that anyway. He came home with a roast chicken. This is for you, he said, putting the chicken on my chest. I was desperate to refuse, to show some defiance, but ravening hunger won, and I ate. Now you know what real hunger is, said Gary. Gary, I never starved you. I never hurt you. I helped you. Why are you doing this? We were friends. He was silent and for a moment I thought he might give me some indication that he remembered when we were pals. But he turned on the TV. I hated him then, hated him with all my heart. I wished I could take that fish gutter to his belly. I wished I had done it before. I determined not to speak again, but after an hour or so, or so my curiosity was too great. What happened at work, I said. He frowned thoughtfully. It went pretty good. I told him you, I, sorry, had a relapse, but that this time I swear I would stay off the bottle forever. Smelling like booze and wearing the good suit worked perfectly, and the circles under my eyes won me some sympathy. But you can see even those are going away. They mentioned rehab, but I resisted that. After all, if I were gone for a month, you'd starve. I let my head sink back onto the pillow, collapsing into utter hopelessness. I supposed he would just eat me away, piece by piece, until there was nothing left. The good news for you is I can let you go soon. Let me go? What do you mean, let me go? Just what I said. I've got crutches for you and a good coat. It's warm and waterproof. You just need a couple more days to heal. I've got new pants for you, and as soon as you can put them on yourself, I'll let you go. The next few days, he came and went without paying me much attention. I tried putting the pants on, but the pain was excruciating. He changed my bandages and started hinting that I should probably try harder with the pants. His voice was impatient. Finally, I did it. It was unbelievably painful and awkward with the handcuffs and only my right fingers, but I did it. Gary cut the right leg short so I would be able to tend to the wound. He undid the chains, but not the cuffs, and he got me to my feet. I made an ineffectual lunge at him. 
Now, now, he said. You're almost there. You don't want to ruin it at the last second. He helped me to the car. We drove in silence. I rested my head on the window and stared at the houses and trees going by, just glad to be out of that couch. We got to the highway. I was too exhausted to even try to figure out where we were going. All I know is that it took a long time. Finally, he pulled up next to an overpass. This ought to work, he said. No one else was around, although there were some bags positioned in dry places. I learned later that other homeless would leave their sleeping bags or blankets there with clothes and other things that wouldn't be stolen as they went about their day. This was before homeless used tents much, so there were some tarps and some cardboard, but otherwise they did rough sleeping the old-fashioned way. He got me to a place that would be protected from the rain. He brought a sleeping bag and a large sack filled with power, power bars, canned goods, water, coupons, $100 cash, and two handles of cheap whiskey. This'll get you started. You can't give me red label on the last day? That would make you a target. Believe me, this'll be better for you. Remember everything I said about living as a raccoon? This will come in handy for you here. You'll remember it as you go, or figure it out. For now, if someone wants your territory, make sure they think you're crazy enough to kill them. Gary, don't do this. Let me live at home. I'll do whatever you want. One other thing, he said. I put the keys to your handcuffs and the fish gutter in the bottom of the backpack. But you want to use the hunting knife I got you just because it has quillions. If you stab with the gutter, your hand will go over the blade and get all cut up. I learned that from Joe Kenda. You know, homicide hunter. Please, Gary. You've stolen everything from me. How can you do this? Mark, it's a tough world, I know. But you'll get used to it. Look, we had a fun time. But things change. Don't go. I'll try to come back with a cardboard box for you. I'll see what I can find. He never came back. So I've been hard scrabbling these streets ever since. The overpass was okay for a little while, but it was terrible for begging. There wasn't a stop sign or a light to stop people getting off the highway. You learn to look for little things like that when you're out there. Those other guys could do a little day labor so it was good to be off the beaten track, but I was losing ground all the time and had to do something. The other guys respected me, but they wouldn't help me. Well, one of them carried my bag a ways down the road back to the city, but that was probably just to get rid of me. I was in and out of some different homeless communities where there's a little honor. I did have to use that knife once. No one believes my story. They think I'm just one more crazy homeless guy with an insane delusion. I tried contacting work once, but they didn't believe me either. Mark Edwards was right there at work. I spoke directly to my boss, and he said, No, Mark Edwards was right there, and that I must be mistaken. I called back a few hours later, pretending to be a client. This is Mark Edwards. Gary. The phone hung up. I'm afraid to go to the police, and if I went home and confronted him, they'd just arrest me. I told my story to a food bank worker once, and she started yesing me the way you do to crazy people. But they don't help you if you're crazy or put you in a mental institution. They just treat you like you're a child. So it's simple. I beg. I walk around, or hobble. I eat. I drink. Never get friendly with a raccoon. They're cute, but they're wild animals, and they don't make good pets.